We often hear legal scholars argue that the US Constitution is more federal than unitary, while the Indian Constitution is more unitary rather than federal, or that the Indian Constitution has a centralizing tendency. What does this really mean? India's adoption of federalism was, like many of its laws, informed by the historical context of partition and perceived secessionist threats faced by certain parts of the country at the dawn of independence. When India gained independence, the basic fear was, will the country survive? Resultantly, while the Objectives Resolution of 1946, adopted by the Constituent Assembly, envisaged a more decentralized conception of federalism, the framers of our Constitution eventually chose to adopt a more centralized model, resisting that suggestion to insert the word federal Dr. Babaseb Ambedkar believed and stated that what is important is that the use of the word union is deliberate because it is indestructible. So you see at the birth of the Constitution, the overarching theme was how do we preserve the nation? And how do we ensure that the nation, the union, is indestructible? And therefore, you find the absence of the word federal in the Constitution when it was adopted. The resistance of our framers to a more classical form of federalism was not unanimous. The beauty of our Constituent Assembly was its own diversity. In fact, I'm reading a very interesting book called The 15, on the 15 women who were part of the Constituent Assembly and the diversity of their traditions and histories. The representatives of the provinces in the Constituent Assembly saw it as a betrayal of the very exercise of framing the Constitution. They resisted the idea of a stronger center. Some even argued that the Constitution which was being adopted was essentially unitary with a mere facade of a parliamentary democracy. The reference for this criticism was the federal model adopted by the United States, where the states have their own constitutions. In contrast, India's single constitution, parliament's powers to amend the constitution, the powers of the governors to refer state laws to the president of India for assent, and the veto of the president over the laws enacted by the states emerged, if I may use that expression, as culprits for the perversion of the purer forms of federalism in India. The centralizing tendency of the Indian Constitution, it is often argued, stems from two of its features. The first, the emergency powers of the Union, and the second, the residuary powers which are vested in the Union Parliament. This I term as a vice of oversimplification. I understand that the legal community is often charged with complicating simple issues with the use of legal jargon. But trust me when I say this, we must peel multiple layers to understand the contours and the scope of the doctrine of federalism in the Indian context. There is no denying the fact that our Constitution does contain centralizing features, such as the emergency powers and residuary legislative powers of the Union Parliament. The emergency powers have been used not merely in times of war and external aggression, as they were used during the course of the Chinese aggression or later on, but also in the times of the internal emergency in 1975. The residuary powers of legislation are given to the Union Parliament. So if a subject is not contained in any of the legislative lists as being conferred to the state legislatures, of necessity it belongs to Parliament. But we must also remember that the Constitution seeks to create a balance. There is, for instance, a rather stringent procedure to amend constitutional provisions which impact the powers of a state.
an amendment to the provisions of the Constitution requires a two-thirds majority in both houses of parliament. However, an amendment to provisions that deal with the legislative and executive power of the states requires a special majority and additionally, a ratification by at least one half of the states. Similarly, the Constitution confers the power to ascend to bills passed by the state legislatures to the governor, who is appointed by the president under the aid and advice of the Council of Ministers. However, the provisions of the Constitution also circumscribe the role of the governor to ensure that the states are not rendered subordinate to the union. So in the process of bringing about this balance, the Constitution has adopted a very delicate framework of governance. One of the problems in scholarly studies of Indian federalism is that they often view the model from a Western lens. The critiques of Indian federalism assumed that the Western model is the ideal model, independent of India's specific needs. Anything else was deemed to be a deviation. And that, I submit, is one of the critical fallacies in the critiques on the Indian Constitution. For too very long in the last 75 years, Indian constitutionalism has been assessed from the perspective of a Western lens. We have to assess both the advantages and the flaws from an Indian cultural and historical lens. That is why the term quasi-federal was used to describe the Indian federal model. This, in my opinion, is not ideal and deserves some critical attention. When we speak of federalism, a model that is suitable to our nation must be adopted. This model must be formulated in the context of the history of the formation of India, our cultural diversity, and our social fabric. An understanding of Indian federalism must also be formulated based on the power structuring arrangements in the constitution between the union and the states and among different states.